ओके तो नमस्कार वेलकम बैक टू दी लास्ट पार्ट ऑफ द सेमेस्टर सो टुडे I want it to be a little short because there's something else for me also to do. But uh, this will be the uh, closing, winding up, uh, summarizing this semester. So the subject has been the science of yoga, right? Now we started first with as Patanjali says in the Yoga Sutras. we started first with the samadhi pada which is the description or discussion on what is the culmination of yoga because you should know where you are going before you start the practice this is how it is there in the sutras first comes samadhi pada which means that's where you head you're heading towards and then comes the uh, uh, what is called the uh, um sadhana pad which is the methods adopted to move forward towards the goal then comes the vibhuti pad which we didn't touch much uh, but we did mention in passing which means the kind of um, increased perceptions and capacities that the yogi develops through practice of sadhana though that is not the most important thing the most important thing is freedom kaivalya so the next chapter the final chapter is kaivalya so sorry i just switch this off for a while uh mm, oh. How do we do that? No. Sorry, I am a little bad at this. So I'm just trying to figure out how to switch this off. Hey, hey, hey! This is not going. This went. This went. Ah, okay. Final release. Kaivalya. <laughs> Now, so <clears throat> the. Uh, the vibhuti pada we is okay kaivalya pada which is the last chapter on the culmination the experience of the yogi who has entered samadhi and understood samadhi in its various uh, details in various stages various uh, uh, what can we say depths so this is the yoga sutra now as i said before yoga is not just confined to the yoga sutras of patanjali you know <clears throat> every chapter of the bhagavad gita is called a yoga in none of this chapters is there any description of asana pranayam pratyahara dharana yes there is in a different way now the gita is studied by many people who practice yoga because if you take the yoga sutras of patanjali and check the various parts and then go to the gita you will find an elaboration of these things in a different way and it is also the aim of the gita to show you that yoga is not only for hermits who sit in caves but is also for people who are or even on the battlefield arjuna krishna actually says to arjuna don't retire and go away saying that i am a holy man not the same words but because i think you just retiring out of fear not due to anything else so fear and failure if it makes you run away you are running away from fear and failure not moving towards moksha moksha and freedom should come while you are still involved of course short periods of 
solitude, as I said before, are good for the practice. Not denying that. So, the Gita has 18 chapters. And each chapter is called a yoga. Now, the Gita is not a purely Vedantic scripture, nor is it a mm, purely a yogic scripture, nor, nor something that deals only with devotion, bhakti. It has all these things added on. And the first chapter starts with Arjuna Vishada Yoga, important. Because it's only at such points, turning points in life happen when you're faced with the situation. Suppose everything is hunky-dory going on. Everything is successful. Um, we think this is all there is to life, right? And uh, even the girlfriend is responding properly. She's not rejecting you and so on. Nobody then thinks about yoga, how to go beyond nothing. It's only when such things happen. Actually, I specifically know a guy who got into practice of meditation only when his girlfriend rejected him. I said it, she did a good thing. For next time you see her, you must touch her feet and say, thank you, you are the guru. <laughs> so, I'm not saying you should do that. What I mean to say is that at a juncture of life <clears throat> where you are in Vishada, Vishada means sorrow, uncertainty, uh, instability. That is the time when yoga of any kind, not just yoga of asanas, of any kind becomes useful. So therefore, what is yoga? It is the practice by which the mind like all of us, all our minds, which is conditioned to think that it is a limited entity, is deconditioned, dehypnotized into understanding that the consciousness that functions through the mind actually comes from an infinite source. Infinite knowledge, infinite energy, and infinite bliss. What more do we want? Now, this is what yoga is all about. Although, in many chapters, there is a chapter in the Gita called Dhyana Yoga, Yoga of Meditation, where asanas are referred to in, in a way where Krishna says, when you are meditating, sit in a comfortable place, not too high or not too low, Keep your head and spine steady. Sit in a comfortable posture. Fix your attention in the Bhru Madhya. And be free. This description is there. Why? Because then there is, a, if you pursue the, uh, the, pursue the study of uh, Dhyana Yoga chapter, which is chapter 6, you will see what are the other things necessary to touch that. And then you will see yama, niyamas, everything mentioned in a different way. In a little bit different way. Then you have the chapter 12, which is called Bhakti. So people think that Bhakti Yoga is there. It's purely singing songs, which is all fine. I'm not against Kirtan, Bhajan, fine. Very good. However, Bhakti Yoga the basic understanding to be derived from it is what I'm, I'll explain to you. Because you are studying the science of yoga, not only the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. Huh. See, till chapter uh, 9, the dialogue between Arjuna and Krishna is normal, like us. I'm saying something, you are asking me questions. In fact, Arjuna even asks more inconvenient questions than you do sometimes. In some in sixth chapter of Dhyana Yoga, Krishna says, your mind should be like a flame where there is no wind. Arjuna says, just a minute. He doesn't say just a minute. I mean, that's what he implies. He says, no, hold on. I can't do this. This is not possible. 
He says, you can control the wind, but I can't control my mind. So what do you think? And so on. Now, so the, it is between, so Arjuna is free to ask questions. He thinks Krishna is my, is also his relative. And he's also his close friend. Also same age group, roughly. And so it's a very friendly that it's like your friend takes you for a drive in a Mercedes Benz. It's like that. Only thing in this Benz is a great chariot hmm, with the horses controlled by the driver, the Sarathi. That's why Krishna is called Partha Sarathi because he is the Sarathi of Partha, Arjuna, the driver. So always respect drivers. They can take you to your destination or they can run you into a ditch. So anyway, so here Krishna is the drive, is a friend who is taking Arjuna, driving him into with his patent tank into the Kurukshetra battle. Now, uh, so everything is fine. Question, answer, argument, discussion. Then in the ninth chapter, something happens. <laughs> the ninth ch chapter, this Krishna who was talking like a friend, suddenly says, among the mountain, among the un unmovables, I am the Himachala. You know, achala means that which doesn't move. Chala, chalana is movement. So among the immovables, I am in the Himalayas. Among the mountains, I am Meru. Huh? <laughs> no, uh, among the rishis, the great sages, munis, I am Kapila. Mm. And so on. Among the Vedas, I am the Samaveda. So what will happen? If I am talking to you just generally, we are having a class semester. One day, at the end of it, I turn around and tell you, I am actually the Himalayas, so I am the Meru. And you, there are two conclusions. Either this guy has got completely nuts, till now he was okay. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there is something we need to look into carefully if we understood what he said. Now, this is the ninth chapter. So, what is happening here is Arjuna's idea about Krishna is undergoing a proper distraction. The image he had made about Krishna uh, because of his various uh, discussions with him and his life he has lived with him is suddenly shaken by this guy saying he, says, he thinks what has happened to this man now. He was sitting here in front of me playing with the gopis in Vrindavan and then suddenly he says, I am Meru and I am Kapila and I am the Samaveda. So what is happening is the framework in which Arjuna thought that everything can be understood by his rational mind, so-called rational mind, is taking a beating slowly. Which means his conditioned mind is beginning to be unconditioned in the ninth chapter, slowly. And I don't know if you have read the Gita and looked into this aspect. Okay, now comes the tenth chapter. No, sorry, the eleventh chapter. The tenth chapter, Meru, Kapila and so on. Not ninth, sorry. In the eleventh chapter comes the final called Vishwarupa Darshana. Suddenly, this Krishna, who is sitting with holding the horse's reins, turns around and Arjuna sees the whole world is passing through him. The entire universe is going through him. All the gods are coming out of him. He's beginning to wonder, is it the same Devaki's child? Who is this? He's totally wonderstruck. He does it. So then he's puzzled and his all his so-called ordinary logic is broken to bits. 
Then comes 12th chapter, Bhakti Yoga, which means, now Patanjali in his practical way says, Chitta Vritti Nirodhaha, that means movement of all distractions from the mind. It also means removing of all images from the mind. It also means breaking all the so-called conditioned thinking that we have. So that the mind in its calmness enters the unconditioned Purusha, the Supreme. In the Gita, it is happening in this way. Your Patanjali is, goes by a systematic step-by-step -step approach. But finally, our three-dimensional thinking has to be broken. At least one should imagine, at least, or suspect that there could be other dimensions other than this. And perhaps the mind has a condition which is free from the conditioning in which it has been put into from birth or many births. Don't worry about many births, at least this birth. So, this, here also there is logic. It's not as if there is no logic. But it's not the small logic based on our ordinary reasoning. Why? This also we discussed in this semester, in the previous semester when we did the Upanishad. We discussed this matter, which means that the world that we know today is only the image offered to us by the senses, by the sense organs. We have no, we know of no other world. We say that we know about this world. Actually, we know only the image given to us by the five senses, which themselves are conditioned. And the inputs from these five senses, which are imperfect in many ways, then work down by the brain to form an image is what we know about the world. We actually don't know how the world actually is. We know only what impressions we have. We have discussed this in detail. I told you how a fly can see something quite different from what we see, and therefore it believes it is like that. We believe it is like this because that's what we see. So what is the real? Now, from the Upanishadic point of view, the real is that which is pure existence. Any form, shape, or color that comes is because of the observer. The observer is the only reality, not that which is observed. What is when you when you free the world from all the conditionings by which it is offered to us by the five senses, you will find that it is also unconditioned. But there is no difference between my, the observer and the observed. But the observed appears to be observed only because it, the impressions we get through our sense organs. That ceases. It still exists. But it exists not as we think it exists. It is pure existence. I don't know how. So, this is the teaching of the Upanishads. And the good news is that every one of us, since we are conscious living beings, have as our source that infinite consciousness, which is existence, pure existence, which is the pure witness, Sakshi, which is the only observer. Right. Uh, you must have heard of a great po uh, poet called Alexander Pope. I don't know if you've heard among his poems, he said something very interesting. He said, the difference is, the difference is as great between the optics seeing as the object seeing. Depending on the optics, the objects are different. So can we say, therefore, the object does not exist? No, the object exists, but it is not as we think it exists. It is existence, pure, which is given shape and form by the mind. 
But it doesn't mean does not exist. It is there. It is exists as pure energy, pure consciousness, and pure movement in different frequencies. Einstein was going very close to this, although his subject was physics. Anyway, so <sighs> this is what the yogic approach takes us through the Yoga Sutra, Ashtanga Yoga, by saying that when the mind is free from distraction, and all the techniques described is how to free the mind from distraction, then that mind becomes quiet and calm. The quiet and calm and tranquil mind is the tarmac from where one takes off to the higher modes of understanding, to the higher levels of consciousness, to the dimensions which are other than the three dimensions, and then realizes that one in true essence is the Purusha, the consciousness. So you understand that in the ultimate essence, it is the consciousness alone that is. Everything else is a modification of the consciousness in different frequencies, from the ultimate point of view, there has been no modification. This is difficult to explain, I understand. So what has it to do with us? In essence, we are also that. Which is what Vedanta means by Tat Tvamasi, you are that. Now it's a great, inspiring uh, message. That promise. You are not this limited little individual with your petty little worries and petty little problems. You are that, what? Purna, that supreme reality. That pure consciousness, that witness of all that exists, that is what you actually are, provided you free and uncondition your mind, which is today caught up in its conditionings. The whole process of yoga, whether through devotion or through Vedanta or through the practice of uh, Ashtanga Yoga, is meant to bring this about. I may add one more, which is Karma Yoga, which means when you work for the good of others, you are actually subconsciously accepting the fact, subconsciously, that the other is not different from you. So you are serving yourself. So, this is what we were going into details. I want to give you a list of uh, books which you can read. Um, one is certainly read the Swami Vivekananda's uh, translation and commentary on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali called Raja Yoga. It's separately available in the Ramakrishna Mission Bookshop. It may also, it's also part of uh, the complete works of Swami Vivekananda, which they have extracted and made a separate book. Actually, it consists of Swami Vivekananda's classes, which he gave on yoga, on the Yoga Sutras, either in England or in the US, I'm not so sure about this. Mm. Then there is a small booklet by a Swami of the Ramakrishna Mission called Pavitrananda. It's an old one which is Yoga Without Nonsense or something like that. It's a very small book. I can't remember the exact name. Then, if you want to go into the details of yoga, as it was even before Patanjali in the Upanishads, early thousand years, Upanishads are already discussing yoga. Many of the Upanishads, which are called Yoga Upanishads, special Upanishads, Yoga Upanishads, they are from the Yajurveda. The second Veda is Yajurveda. Rig Veda, Yajurveda. So the Yajurveda has two sections. Krishna Yajurveda and Shukla Yajurveda. This comes from both. Krishna Yajurveda and Shukla Yajurveda. Both of them have texts on yoga. Especially, I think, the uh, Shukla Yajurveda. Texts on yoga which describe yoga. And if you, you will, if you go to the 
Yoga Pradipika or any one of the other books or any of the Nath texts like Goraksha Shataka and so on, you will see that it reflects what has already been said a thousand years ago. And this Yoga Upanishads are about 20 in number. Those who want to do serious research on yoga certainly should read this Yoga Upanishads. And they are available in English translation. The only translation I know of, you can go and search on Google, I know of, is one brought out by the Theosophical Society Adair. Mm, by, I think, Srinivasa Shastri or somebody. It's an English translation, all the 20 yoga Upanishads. All the practices that you see in later textbooks, the roots of that are all there in this. If you go, you'll see it there. So, that. Then, if you want to go into the details of asana, pranayama, because Patanjali does not mention asanas in detail. He does not mention pranayama in detail. He only mentions. If you want to go into details, the traditional text followed is again written by somebody from the Nath Sampradaya called Swatma Rama. Yoga Pradipika. There's another textbook you can research on. But again, let me warn you, don't do any practices, especially the higher practices of yoga, without a personal guide or proper guidance. Not by reading the books. This is only for research to make you understand more. Why? Because it's like getting into a laboratory, even though you have read about everything, and trying to do an experiment without your guide. In a physics laboratory, it could end up even in an explosion, even in a chemical lab. Forget about uh, trying to dissect the body. Hmm? Uh, or uh, doing a surgical experiment without a doctor supporting you. So, this is my advice. So when you go back, all the things I couldn't have done in, a, in the semester, I could not have discussed, I'm sure. So there are some points which may still be there. I would, uh, it would be nice if you could read some of these books. Uh, many of these books are also available in different publications. Um, in Hindi as well as in English. So please go through it. Having said that, we conclude the session today on the semester, Science of Yoga. And if you have any questions, we have some more time when we can work on them. Any questions based on what we discussed now and also before? Any questions, Manu? Will you see? Dr. Jyoti is not here. Uh, I didn't see him. Uh, yes, sir. Actually, uh, he got busy. Uh, he just uh, recalled that. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, That's okay. So, Vishal has a question. Yes, please. Vishal. Namaste, Guruji. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, you, you have talked about having a practical guru. So, mm. one, where to find it? Where such find such a person? And second is a book is always a one-way communication, right? It, you, it can't answer your question after a certain level, right? You're right. So there are a lot of questions that I already have. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's beyond the scope of this course also and time yes. also. Uh, what you, to do? Can, can you email me? Definitely, sir. You can get the email from Professor Jyoti or uh, Professor uh, uh, Jay. I'm, I'm here. Jay. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Also, yeah, you can get from him or Rahul you can get from Rahul, Professor Rahul, yeah. one of these people, and just email the questions to me. Huh? Definitely. Sir. Now, I suggest that in the subject, you say follow up of the IIT sem semester so that I can okay, discuss. Sir. Because I get yes. innumerable emails. If, you, if I find that, I know that this is dealing with this particular thing. Now, when I said you need a teacher, 
Now for ordinary practice like yoga, asanas and all that, there are many institutes around which teach you yoga. I am specially concerned about doing yogic practices like kundalini, you know, that kind of thing. You could go haywire if you don't have a proper teacher. That's what I mean. Remember that. Hmm. Okay, sir. But where to find that person also? Because there's no point in stopping in, in between of a study, right? As a so send me a mail, you know, let, me, let me work on this. There okay, are sir. people available. Don't worry about that. Okay, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Your question is very important, actually. Instead of going around in circles in the wrong direction, is better. Yeah. Yes. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, sir, uh, I was in my uh, art of living center uh, a day ago, uh, Mathura. So I have done meditation first time, or uh, that that is Sudarshan Kriya. Right? Okay. So, like, what is the energy in Soham, Soham bird? Okay. Uh, that brings our body and mind to concentrate very easily. Fine. Thank you. So, that's okay. So, you can continue to do it. Only thing is, don't stop it in between. Huh? No, I, I, I think she had another. I can't hear you, Professor. I can't hear you. <coughs> oh. Uh, she was asking. She was asking about uh, soham. Mm. She was saying that what what is the what soham, is the energy? Soham in the... energy. Yeah. What is that soham? Soham, like yeah. we uh, so they uh, they play a sound like soham soham in different like uh, in different way like fast slow and we meditate then. Yeah. So what is the bird? Uh, what is energy in that bird? Soham. There is no energy in Soham, but Soham is a mantra chanted to keep your mind fully absorbed in your internal pranas. Like we in Kriya Yoga don't do Soham, but we do Hamsa, which means when you inhale, you do Ham, and when you exhale, you do Sa in the mind, not loudly. Uh, Soham also can be done. It is a way to generate attention within yourself rather than let the mind wander here and there. It, Soham is a 1,000-year-old practice. It works not because Sri Sri has put some energy into it. It's an ancient 1,000-year-old technique which anybody who practices will get a benefit out of. Yes, sir. sir they told us the only thing is it cannot be patented by anybody. Hmm. Yes. They told us how can we practice in home, like easily. Yes. So that yes. So you should you can continue with the practice. Don't give it up. It's a wonderful practice. All I'm saying is that it is not does not belong to anybody. It's an ancient uh, technique. But Thank since you. it is taught to you by somebody, give due respect. Yes. Thank you. Welcome. Anything else? Shalini is still there on the screen. I can see her. Uh, Manu? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, uh, Vishal uh, has a question. Yes. Vishal Sharma has another question. Yeah. Uh, so, so, there are a lot of techniques in the in the religious texts also, for example, Gayatri Opasana, is it just another yes. way of uh, meditating or is it just, is, is a different path or there are a lot of cleansing you have to do and a lot of other processes are there? Can all you give the, some light on that? Huh, all the processes in any school of thought or any teaching basically talks about cleansing. Now, cleansing here means making the mind free of all distractions. Now, to make the mind free of all distractions, we cannot indulge, uh, keep on indulging in our old habits. So we need to change our old habits and make new habits appear. So therefore, that is what they meant by cleansing. And Gayatri Sadhana basically is the chanting of the Gayatri Mantra. 
and gayatri mantra is a very important special mantra the rishi of gayatri is vishwamitra great rishi he is the one who actually taught the gayatri for the first time and in the rigveda the gayatri is such an important mantra that uh, the chandas the tune in which it is chanted is called the gayatri chandas it's a very important mantra now if you chant the gayatri regularly automatically some cleaning and cleansing will take place there is no problem out there uh, but you have to do it silently rather than loudly gayatri is basically meant for silent chanting inside the mind and the mantra uh, we, we cannot discuss the we, we might have to have a complete semester to discuss the gayatri actually seriously because it starts with om we need four classes to discuss om at least two and then we go to the next bhu bhuswa and discuss that i'm breaking it up so that i'm not accused of having given the gayatri so then then you have to in the second sen- sentence tat savitra varini and so on and so forth so but i think gayatri is a very personal affair it is not a mass phenomenon it's a personal affair each person should sit and chant by herself or himself but i am of the opinion that girls should also chant the gayatri which is a little deviation from the orthodox mode okay <laughs> Hello, uh, uh, sir. Actually, I wanted to ask a question. If I can, uh, please. Of course. Why shouldn't you? <laughs> sir, actually, I am the TA, so I was avoiding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You uh, should ask. Uh, sir, basically, I was interested. Uh, I read about uh, and was uh, influenced not by the Bhakti tradition. Ah, say so that again. Uh, I was uh, affected, uh, affected, and influenced a lot by Bhakti tradition as well as Bhakti uh, tradition. Uh, okay. Bhakti okay. tradition. Mm-hmm. And especially, sir, I wanted to ask that: Is it possible what uh, Sri Ram Krishna Paramhansa did? Because he did it the yoga. What is being uh, referred that he did the yoga way, the Bhakti way? I mean, uh, uh, for me, it is difficult to say that I can uh, do the dharma part for either myself or for others. So, uh, sir. Did he really? Uh, I mean, because how could he explore uh, using multiple ways? I mean, he uh, as far uh, as as far as Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa is concerned, I don't think he was an ordinary man. Honestly, he was a special man. <laughs> There are such people born, you know, like child prodigies. <laughs> I think he was the child. I'm telling. I'll tell you why. Because even at the age of eight. or nine when he was not doing any sadhana when he was just a village boy in his village in kamar pokur oh, just like all other children he was just walking along the paddy fields one day eating some murmuras or whatever and then suddenly it was a cloudy day and the whole sky was clouded with black clouds suddenly he saw some white cranes fly across the dark clouds now so many young boys have seen this <laughs> ram krishna was affected strangely this contrast of the white cranes flying across the black clouds hit him somewhere and he simply shouted mago and fell down unconscious mago means you know in bengali it means ma mm. it took some time for him to recover consciousness when he recovered consciousness he felt something had happened and he started thinking about it he didn't have a guru at that time he didn't have anybody so i am trying to say that he was a special individual 
and once in a while such special individuals happen on this earth. Mm. Now, then Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa got married. All these things happened. He didn't study much. Go to school. He didn't feel like sitting within the confines of four walls. He was not interested. Anyway, then at a young age of 20, 21 or something, he was made the priest of a Kali temple in Dakshineshwar, in Calcutta. Actually, his brother Ram Kumar was the priest. Because he was working old, he asked his brother to come and help him. And he was doing the puja of the Shakti there, called Kali, Bhadrakali. Now, I, it's difficult to go into details because we need to wind up now. But I'm giving you, a, since you put, you asked, you took up the subject. Uh, he started worshipping the mother goddess, Kali. Gradually, the worship turned into love affair between him and Kali. He, this boy who had that experience when he was nine years, therefore had an extraordinary mind. It was not an ordinary mind. So something happened in the relationship between him and this mother goddess. He started, he, his one pointed attention then was to have a darshan of this goddess, actually like a living being, not in the image, not as an image. And one day he got that vision. We got the darshan of the mother. But the first time he had the darshan is interesting. He didn't see the mother's form. He only saw liquid light like silver and a big ecstatic feeling in his heart. And he was unconscious for some, I mean unconscious to the world for some time. Woke up. From then on his life took a completely different turn. And this man who started his uh, yogic career through bhakti practiced every yogic system in the world which was available. He started there. Then came Bhairavi Brahmani who taught him tantras. He became the student. He became a student. He didn't say, oh, I got the vision of darshan of Kali, so I'm... He said, please teach me. And she asked. That humility was extraordinary. And then, from that humility of Ramakrishna is unimaginable. And I think humility comes when there is this divine experience. Such uh, saints do not expect you to crawl on the floor and kiss their feet. They see the divine also in you. So was Ramakrishna. It was like, Everybody else, when you talk to people. So, anyway. Uh, then he learned the tantras from Bhairavi Brahma. Then came the great Vedanta in Tothapuri. He learned Vedanta from him. Where all images are broken. And acting on the instructions of Tothapuri, he even broke through the image of Kali. Even though that is where he started with his bhakti. And then, and so on and so on. Then he did some Christian sadhana. Then he did some Sufi sadhana. Any sadhana that you can imagine he has done. This is why I am saying he is a special individual. Usually, one person goes through one and attains the culmination. By then it's time to die. <laughs> All one gamut of experiences. And important. After going through all this, he said, through practice, I am convinced that all paths lead to the same goal. He didn't say theory. He could say it with complete conviction because he had gone through it. This is Sri Ramakrishna. So, well, it's, it's wonderful the kind of bhakti he had and all that. But we cannot imitate him. It's not possible. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda made that very clear to his brother disciples, to his guru wives. He said, don't imitate Thakur. He is one individual. You do your own personal sadhana and see where you can go. 
Yes, sir. Uh, so that's what it is. So uh, I think we need to wind up now. I also have to go. So thank you very much. It was a great experience having you all uh, for the uh, this semester. And uh, let me see if I can see you, at least some of you in Delhi. I don't know. I'm not sure. We'll work this out. Um, and uh, so we'll wait for the next. Ah, Dr. Jyoti is also back. So, so we'll wait in uh, for the next course to start after some time. Give it, give me a little time because I'm traveling abroad. I'll come back only end of June or something. So we can think of something only after that. I know we can do internet even from the US. But when I go there, I'm so busy, back to back. It's also because two years I haven't been because of COVID. So let me come back, then we'll work something out. It was a good experience for me, a learning experience for you, I hope. It certainly was a learning experience for me because I see how young minds are now thinking about various factors, not only physics, metaphysics. So thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, next semester course on Gayatri. Oh, I guess. Not a bad idea. Let me think about it. <laughs> thank you so much, sir. Okay.